Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kim Beer. I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation. And I would like to welcome you to our August update for advocacy and for especially for our regional champions. So we really are grateful to everyone who's taken the time this afternoon to join us. Um, before we get started, I'd like to go over the agenda and welcome our, my fellow panelists today. Um, today we'll be addressing, we'll have introductions, and I'd like to welcome uh, our new colleague, Chris Carson, and I'll get to Chris in just a second. Uh, we'll do an overview and recap of the Regional Champions Program and some of the activities we've been doing the past few months, especially in reviewing a lot of the work we've been doing around COVID-19. And we'll talk about and remind all of you about some REAV activities upcoming, and so making sure that you're staying connected to the foundation and to all the work we're doing to keep you informed of um, all health-related issues and updates around COVID and all the activities that the foundation is um, taking, taking part in. Of course, we'll give you an update on COVID-19. We'll present um, some updates around uh, FY21 appropriations and the response legislation that we're hoping will take place um, this month, we're not sure. We'll be hearing from John Sawyer about uh, the COVID-19 response. Uh, we'll have Chris talk about an advocacy update in August outreach and messaging, and we'll touch a little bit on planning uh, to vote in a pandemic. And then, of course, we'll take your questions and answers at the end. If you fill in at the bottom there, you can um, submit your question, or you can also submit them in the audience chat. Audience chat and we'll do our best to monitor them, monitor, monitor them throughout the presentation. Before we get started, I do want to welcome Chris, who's our new policy and advocacy coordinator. And we're so thrilled he started in mid-July, and we hope that many of you have had the opportunity to meet with him over the phone or virtually via Zoom. And Chris has a really interesting background, and again, we're really thrilled that he's joined the foundation. And he's most recently been covering daily legislative procedures of the U.S. Congress as a managing editor um, at the Federal Network, which is a credentialed news organization and the leading provider of multimedia content of the Congress. And prior to that, he spent 2016 uh, managing grassroots political campaigns to educate activists and voters on candidates and issues leading up to the November election. He led a regional campaign covering three cities in Southern Virginia and training communities on how to engage their neighbors on issues surrounding criminal justice reform. And before moving to Washington, he spent several years working as a journalist. So again, welcome Chris, and you'll hear more from him uh, later on. Um, so I think I'm actually gonna pass it over to Chris right now. Chris? Yeah, thank you, Kim. It's uh, it's so great to be here with everybody. And you know, as Kim mentioned, I'm new to the Reeb Foundation, but I couldn't be I couldn't be happier with my position here. And uh, I'm really looking forward to working more closely with all of our regional champions on this very important program. Um, just an overview. You can see on the slide here some outlines as to as to what the regional champions do and I'd like to first thank the regional champions that have gotten involved just here in my first month at the Reeve Foundation. You've been really doing your part as first responders. We've sent out two action alerts on uh, really important issues facing Congress already um, and we're looking forward to doing more of that. Um, the thing to that I do want to highlight, though, as, as I move into this role, is that coming from the journalism background, I really want to I really want to be available and working with our regional champions on developing those relationships and particularly educating legislators and their staff on these important issues. The thing that I've heard time and again um, in my in my short time here already is that it's really the stories, your stories that push the ball forward on so many of these key issues. So um, if you have any creative ideas or on how you can, how we can maybe present those stories in the future, or if, if you know someone, you want to recruit uh, someone that you know to join our advocacy efforts, please reach out to me. 
um, and we can set that up. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about attending events and, and setting up meetings with your member later on in the webinar. And of course, there are some particular challenges to that in the time of COVID. Um, but I'm here, I'm here to work with you all and to, to work around that and to make sure that you're, you're being heard by your member. So I'll kick it back over to Kim. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, as a reminder, before we get into the nuts and bolts of what's happening in Washington, we want to make sure that you constantly visit um, our updates around COVID-19. And I think the best way to do that is really to keep tabs on our blog. And I know many of you participated by uh, sending in your own blog and your own personal experience, not only during this pandemic, but just in the past. And so we really appreciate your participation. And of course, Nurse Linda continues to educate the community about making sure that you can stay safe and healthy during this time. And of course, we'll continue to update you through social media and through blog posts around policy updates. We'll continue to have webinars. And we're constantly updating health-related information, a lot of which we follow CDC and local state authorities or, uh, through the Paralysis Resource Center. And then some fun events. Um, I know many of you are probably a little zoomed out and maybe a webinar out, but we have some fun activities coming up, fundraisers for the foundation, but ways to connect with your fellow uh, community members. So please keep your eyes out for some additional webinars and some fundraising activities. And finally, I would, um, I, if I forget to mention this, it would be really shame on me because next month is Spinal Cord Injury Awareness Month. And we'll, we're going to do uh, big campaigns around raising awareness, keeping members of Congress informed about the work that you're doing and the work that the Reed Foundation is doing and ensuring that we're able to represent the needs for the paralysis community. So if you have any questions at all about any of those activities, feel free to reach out to Chris or myself or John. I'll be sure to connect you to the correct staff member. So I think I'm going to now pass it over to John. All right. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Kim. Uh, hi, folks. This is John Sawyer uh, from Waxman Strategies, consultant to the foundation. Uh, again, as Kim and Chris said, uh, really, really wonderful to be with you all today. Uh, and to be giving a little bit of an update. I, I think you'll find that uh, you'll hear some of the frustration in, in our voices as we go through sort of the state of the pandemic and the state of the congressional response. I think each of us wishes that we had more progress uh, on both fronts to share with you, but I think it's really important that we uh, give you sort of a, an understanding of the state of play as we're hearing it, as we're understanding it, and I, you know, I think what what we know to be true is members of Congress and policymakers across the country are responsive to constituents. They will uh, respond if they're hearing from you. And so, one of the ways to really channel that frustration, I think that that you may hear from us about the lack of activity that we're seeing, um, is to really get involved and get your voice being heard and get active in advocacy going forward. So uh, with that sort of caveat up front, I do want to start just by uh, giving uh, a snapshot of the pandemic itself. Um, we're, you know, now five or six months into this. And unfortunately, uh, at a national level, the trends that we're seeing in terms of pandemic spread are not positive. Um, if folks remember, you know, in the early days of this, there was so much discussion about flattening the curve and the idea that if we can get the number of cases uh, under control in particular regions and across the country, then what you can do is devote significant resources to contact tracing, uh, to testing, and to isolation of folks who are suspected as positive cases. And that's the way that, that a lot of other countries around the world have really been able to flatten that curve. And I think what you see here is that there was some success with that initially, uh, but that, you know, there seems to be a growing consensus that at least in many parts of the country, uh, we've opened uh, up a little bit too early. And as a result of that, we've seen that sort of second spike in cases uh, followed on by uh, a spike in the reported deaths from COVID-19. Um, 
both of these are charts from several days ago as we were putting these slides together. I think a, a minor piece of good news is that these uh, trends are starting to flatten again. Um, but I think, you know, we don't want to see an ongoing sort of plateau at this many new cases, 60,000, you know, new cases a day or upwards of 1,000 new deaths a day. And so, you know, I think one of the things that we're focused on here is the importance of the policy response, um, but also just the importance of really, you know, those most basic of, of um, guidances that we were all internalizing all the way back in March around uh, hygiene, around social distancing, uh, around, you know, not going in anywhere out if, if you're feeling sick, those kinds of things. So um, I think it is important to note that as, as has been the case all along, what we've seen is not sort of one uniform national pandemic, but rather uh, a series of uh, pandemics playing out on a regional basis in the United States. And of course, when we first uh, were doing these sort of COVID updates in March, what we saw in March and April was uh, the spike being very contained to the Northeast uh, and to some extent to the Pacific Northwest and, and to Southern California where there were early uh, cases largely driven by international travel. Um, we still have seen that, you know, the spike in New York uh, City, but also New York State in March and April uh, is the largest that we've seen. Um, but at this point, the pandemic has really shifted towards more rural and suburban areas of the country, towards the Midwest, as you can see here, and especially towards the South, uh, to some extent towards the Central Valley of California uh, and into the Rio Grande Valley in Texas are some of the real hotspots now and so you know i think the the lesson there is that you know at a regional level um, this can be brought under control the, the numbers in the northeast are comparable to countries in europe that have gotten things under control but uh we we need you know continue to need uh, a, a national response in addition to a regional and a state and a local response um, and so I think that's the way that, you know, policymakers hopefully are coming to view this. I think there's been a real challenge with the, U the U.S. system, the federalist system, where we have uh, historically states have a lot of the authority when it comes to public health. Um, the, you know, the local county health departments have a lot of different uh, authorities and have historically been underfunded. And so what we're seeing is, again, it playing out slightly differently on a regional basis. Uh, and what we're going to talk about when it comes to the congressional responses, where there's a possibility for federal action there. It's not all uh, discouraging news. And I think one uh, potential bright spot that we're hearing about and monitoring is the progress that's being made both in the United States and around the world on uh, the development of both vaccines and uh, therapeutics to treat COVID and to lessen the impact of COVID. Um, one of the reasons, as we understand it, that the, the spike in deaths has not followed the spike in cases uh, to the same magnitude is that there are drugs being used and there are sort of things that are being learned about how to treat COVID uh, at this point, um, as well as, you know, there's some insights that we've been monitoring around the development of vaccines. You know, there's the, the experts who are really focused on this are uh, cautiously optimistic that we may see a vaccine by the end of the year, uh, if not early next year. Um, there remain some challenges around how that vaccine gets distributed, how it gets paid for. Uh, we'll talk about those in a moment, but I know Chris uh, caught some really interesting insights from Dr. Fauci in a recent congressional hearing that he was monitoring um, around vaccines and vaccine trials. So, Chris, do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, yeah, Dr. Fauci was 
was first of all talking about trying to ease some of the anxiety that people may be feeling regarding the speed at which the vaccine is being developed and um just talked a little bit about the, the sort of built up resistance that the human body has to a virus of this nature. And of course I'm not a doctor, so I'm not gonna talk too much on that. But one thing that he did mention, which I thought was important to pass along to everyone, is that in the early clinical trials for a vaccine, they really need a diverse range of people. And he was really encouraging people from all walks of life to sign up. And you can go to coronaviruspreventionnetwork.org um, and find a sign-up sheet to to get in, to volunteer to get involved in a vaccine study. Um, obviously do this in consultation with your own doctor, um, but considering the unique needs of the community that we work with, uh, we want to make sure that if it's possible that that um, that's being considered as these experts are putting together a vaccine that will work for, for all people and with all varieties of uh, immune systems. So I wanted to throw that out there. Thank you, John. Yeah, you bet. Thank you for that that insight, Chris. And it's, it, again, really an important point. It, the other thing I think that's interesting and different from past vaccine development efforts here is that uh, using some of the money that was made available in earlier legislative packages, policymakers are really taking the approach of taking whatever steps they can to expedite this process while still being safe. And one of the ways that they're doing that is by committing to purchase uh, doses of vaccines um, even before those vaccines have completed what's called the phase three trial. In other words, the, the large scale trials that really assure um, safety and efficacy of a vaccine. And so just because the government is committing to purchase those doses does not mean they're going to committing to use them. The important thing there is that they're guaranteeing uh, that the manufacturers will have a market. They're guaranteeing that there will be an incentive to do the manufacturing. They're helping fund the manufacturing itself so that if we do hit a vaccine that really works, we don't have to then scale up in all of that production afterwards. And I think that's likely to hopefully accelerate this process, assuming there is a safe and effective vaccine by several months. So again, hope, hope uh, does lie there. I think there's you know, a really important global collaboration happening between um, scientists around the world on this. Um, I don't think there's ever been an effort quite like that. And so, um, you know, it's not to say it's not without its challenges, but I think that's a place to look for optimism. Lastly, just, you know, anybody who's been following the news has certainly seen, I think, that, that a number of the challenges listed here are um, you know front and center as we go through the summer and into the fall. Obviously, the question of schools uh, is on so many people's minds uh, as people sort of figure out you know the balance between the importance of kids being in school uh, and the importance of education, socialization, et cetera, with balanced with you know obviously the the ability and the need to keep. Uh, students and teachers and administrators and staff all safe uh, in the virus. Um, one of the concerns a lot of people have, a lot of experts have, is that as we head into the winter, uh, we're going to start to see fewer outdoor gatherings and more indoor gatherings. And one thing we do know uh, with some certainty is that there is a lo much lower risk of transmission when folks are outdoors. And so uh, just a concern that those indoor gatherings are really part of what's going to drive uh, a renewed transmission of the virus. Interestingly, there's some speculation uh, and research that shows that this is part of what's been driving the increases in the virus in the South and in the Southwest. You know, in Arizona, for instance, where it's well over 100 degrees every day uh, in the summer, that's when indoor gatherings are happening. Uh, and so there's some tracking uh, that's, that's looking at that. Um, again, we spoke to the regional nature of, of the pandemic, and you know, one of the things that also varies regionally is the capacity of hospitals. So that's one of the things that, you know, in the early guidelines about how states should be looking at opening, 
they really did look at hospital capacity, uh, the testing capacity, the, um, you know, and then the case counts, all of those things taken together are really what local and, and regional governments should be looking at in terms of evaluating their, their ability to reopen. Uh, you know, I think unfortunately part of what we've seen is that people haven't necessarily followed those larger federal guidelines in, in waiting until those, all of those metrics were being hit. And that's why we've seen uh, some of the spikes that we've seen. Um, we mentioned that vaccine distribution uh, is likely to be a challenge. I think the good news is that a lot of people are focused on this now in terms of how uh, the government and vaccine manufacturers and the healthcare system need to work to prioritize vulnerable committees, uh, communities, excuse me, um, as well as you know those essential workers and healthcare workers who are really need to be first in line for vaccine distribution. Um, there's also you know the the ongoing challenge of vaccine skepticism uh, and you know the information that can spread so easily through social media misinformation about safety and efficacy of vaccines and the worry that because this is being done so quickly, uh, you know, it may be more susceptible to that kind of concern. So I think that's the kind of thing that a lot of folks actually are really focused on now, uh, in addition to uh, the actual science behind developing the vaccine itself. And then I think, you know, what we will talk about now really reflects one of the larger epidemiological challenges. Uh, it, it doesn't sound like one of the things that's usually listed in the epidemiology, but the actual political polarization and some of the gridlock that we're seeing where, you know, an inability of the federal government to respond effectively at this stage, I think itself is a real challenge uh, to the spread of the virus. And, you know, obviously what we haven't spoken to is the economic consequences of the virus, but obvious, there's, there's, I think, growing consensus that without an effective control of the virus itself and the infection that comes along with it, uh, it's very difficult to expect or to see an economic recovery that's going to track. And so those things go hand in hand. Um, and the, the political challenges really that underlie all of this are a real threat factor. So um, with that, I, I think we'll transition into giving you a little bit of an update on what's going on in Congress. Um, while most of our focus in the webinar and you know, in our sort of day-to-day -day has been in tracking and, and, and weighing in on COVID response legislation, we will talk about that. Uh, extensively, but I want to start actually with um, what we would be talking about at this stage in the year if there were no pandemic, which is uh, the annual appropriations process. And there is some good news there uh, in some, you know, ongoing challenges, but um, as a reminder, the appropriations process is the annual process that Congress undertakes to fund programs across the government, to fund the government itself. Um, that process is ongoing amidst all of the rest of what's been being discussed. Basically, I think Congress at this stage is really only focused on appropriations and COVID response in terms of legislation that's going to pass into law. Um, but, you know, they do need to pass appropriations legislation or pass what's called a continuing resolution, basically putting the government on autopilot before the October 1st, uh, which is the end of the fiscal year, or if that doesn't happen, we end up in a government shutdown. So that's a process that we are always engaged in. Uh, many of you as advocates have been really engaged in. Uh, and so I want to give you a little bit of an update on where we stand, in particular when it comes to funding for the PRC, for the Paralysis Resource Center that, of course, the Reed Foundation operates. Um, so the good news is uh, the House, uh, in the House, the uh, Senate or the House Appropriations Committee, Subcommittee, uh, Full Committee, and now the Full House have passed legislation for next year, uh, and that includes our full request of $9.7 million uh, for the Paralysis Resource Center. If you recall, 
Last year, we saw a $1 million increase in funding from 8.7 to 9.7 million. Um, we were really enthused about that. Uh, the, the foundation staff has been working really closely with ACL to figure out how to put that, those new resources into place. And so in this next year, what we've asked for is level funding at that $9.7 million level. Um, and that's what the House included. It also included language, uh, taking a look at the ACL um, state pilot programs. We've maybe talked about this in the past, but uh, starting in the Trump administration, the ACL started a state level uh, PRC pilot program uh, that sort of duplicates some of the functions of what the national PRC does, especially in terms of grant making. Um, that's a thing that we've been trying to keep an eye on and understand, and so Congress is also now asking ACL to look at uh, how to make sure that there's not overlap between the state pilot programs and the activities of the national PRC. So that's language we worked with the House Appropriations Committee on, and that was included in the House bill. Um, the picture in the Senate is not as uh, uh, positive. So the Senate appropriations process is essentially stalled. Um, that's because there needs to be bipartisan agreement in the Senate in order to pass this, le this kind of legislation. Uh, and there are major policy differences you know, on everything from the border wall uh, to you know, overall COVID funding, et cetera. So uh, rather than go through the motions and have a contentious process, the Senate have basically stalled on that. I think what we may see is them release draft legislation in the fall, uh, but the idea that I think they're gonna pass entire bills through the Senate before October 1st is pretty unlikely. And so the, the most likely outcome that we're likely to see this fall is a continuing resolution, uh, again, that basically says we're gonna continue all programs at their current levels uh, before October 1st, and with a date until after the election, probably sometime in mid-December. Um, and then the result of that will really depend on what happens in the election, uh, where we go from there. Um, in terms of the PRC, if there is a continuing resolution, the good news is what we've asked for in terms of funding is the same as we asked for, as the same as we got last year. And so uh, a continuing resolution would essentially amount to the same thing that we've asked for in terms of next year's funding. So I wanna switch gears then and talk a little bit about the COVID response. And uh, you know, this may be a lot on one slide, uh, but just to give you some idea of you know, how this has gone so far when it comes to the legislative response to the pandemic. I think what's fair to say is that we saw a really extraordinary amount of activity uh, in, this, in March, you know, we saw three pieces of legislation pass in March, uh, each, you know, an order of magnitude larger than the next. Um, and though that, you know, culminated with the third bill, uh, the CARES Act, which really included a lot of the major programs that have sort of held up the economy and worked on, um, uh, you know, going after the pandemic itself, some of the vaccine programs I mentioned earlier, the small business loan programs that we've talked about in earlier bills, uh, the enhanced unemployment benefits uh, that have given folks who are now facing unemployment an additional $600 a week, all of that was included in the third piece of legislation. What has become clear since then is that Congress is having a much more difficult time uh, with what comes next. And so just to look at this timeline here, you know, that the, the CARES Act passed at the end of March. Um, the House in the middle of May passed what's called the HEROES Act. And the, the House HEROES Act really represents, we'll talk more about details in a moment, but it really represents uh, the House's largest, uh, most ambitious, you know, set of responses to the pandemic to the economic crisis uh, to the health crisis that you know they could put together and that was legislation costing over three trillion dollars um, the reaction to that in the senate was that they did not want to see a package that large but in fact they wanted to wait and see 
whether the initial three pieces of legislation were enough uh, to get you know the country through uh, and there was a real reluctance especially in the Senate majority around you know additional spending um, it so there was no action in the Senate for that second half of May no action through June and really what we didn't we didn't see a Senate proposal until as you can see here the HEAL Act, which is the Senate version of COVID legislation introduced on July 27th. Um, what you can also see here is that at the beginning of that week, they introduced the HEALS Act. At the end of that week was the expiration of that $600 unemployment payment uh, that I mentioned. Uh, I think the hope was to use the expiration of that payment to drive activity. Uh, unfortunately, after a couple of weeks of negotiations, those have really uh, those negotiations have really fallen apart. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but President Trump over the weekend, after those negotiations fell apart at the end of last week, President Trump announced several executive actions. Um, the consensus is really that without the force of legislation, those executive actions really don't have a, a major effect or are not likely to have a major effect in you know, sustaining the economic recovery. Um, so we'll talk about those in a minute, but just to point out that you know, after a real flurry of activity at the beginning of the pandemic, um, we've unfortunately seen Congress revert to form a little bit here. And uh, the, you know, what, what we need to make sure of is that they continue to understand the need to act. So before we go into that, I do want to just talk a little bit about comparing those two proposals, the House Heroes Act and the Senate Heals Act. Um, obviously, these are you know, multi-hundred page pieces of legislation. So this is a very, very high level look, uh, but these tend to be some of the things that people focus on in terms of what, where the real differences are between the House and the Senate legislation. So um, first of all, the overall size, as we discussed, the House bill, somewhere around three and a half trillion dollars, Senate bill just uh, under a trillion. Um, the unemployment benefit extension, as I mentioned, the House bill would extend that $600 a week provision until the end of January. Uh, the Senate bill includes uh, a couple of months of $200 a week, uh, and, there, and then they ask states to basically replace that $200 a week with 70% of whatever individuals lost wages were um, from October till the end of the year. Um, a big issue that's come up is aid to state and local governments. Um, without getting into all the details of it, state and local governments have really seen major revenue hits because you know their tax base is kind of falling apart as businesses have to close, et cetera. Um, and state and local governments fund crucial things like education, uh, Medicaid, obviously really of interest to our uh, community, uh, corrections and other things. So, um, the House bill includes almost a trillion dollars in aid to state and local governments. You can see how it's split up here. Uh, the Senate bill does not include any funding to state and local governments uh, from the federal government. One thing we're particularly focused on here is Medicaid um, and the degree to which the whatever legislation comes will increase the federal uh, share of Medicaid, both for Medicaid overall and there are also proposals to increase the federal share of funding for Medicaid services, Medicaid home and community-based services, which is something we've been really focused on alongside the rest of the disability community. Um, actually, both bills do include direct payments to individuals, um, and I have actually a typo here, but the, both are $1,200 per adult. The Senate bill actually is $500 per dependent, whereas the House bill is $1,200 per dependent. Apologies for that typo. Um, a priority of the Senate has been to shield uh, schools and businesses and other organizations from liability. The idea being if folks are coming back to work, uh, there will be a disincentive for people to reopen if they're exposed to lawsuits if people get sick. Um, that's, there's no similar provision included in the House bill, but the Senate bill does include those kinds of provisions. And then you can see here just a difference in the amount of funding 
that would be invested in the healthcare system itself, both a provider fund that primarily goes to hospitals and clinics and other providers, um, as well as into the vaccine effort uh, and testing and tracing. Uh, so, although the discussions really aren't just about, at this stage, you know, reconciling House and Senate bills, I thought it was important, we thought it was important to really cover, you know, the content of those bills, at least at a high level, so you have a sense of the difference in approach. So, where do we think things are going to go from here? Obviously, um, the latest is that, um, after two weeks of negotiations, starting with the increase in the uh, Senate bill, uh, starting with the introduction of the Senate bill, excuse me, um, no deal has been reached. Uh, the negotiators, who are primarily um, the House and Senate Democratic leadership, and then the White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, and the Treasury Secretary, Steve Mnuchin, uh, say that they are still trillions apart on what's needed. Um, over the weekend, uh, President Trump announced a series of executive actions, uh, one executive order and three executive memoranda uh, on several of the key issues involved here. And we don't need to go into the, the details of how those work exactly, other than to say that, you know, even those who are uh, supportive of those actions will acknowledge and have acknowledged on, on some of the Sunday shows over the weekend that they don't hold nearly the effect that legislation would hold. And the, the main difference uh, in what you can do in legislation versus what you can do through executive action is um, only Congress can spend money. And it's under the Constitution. They have what's called the power of the purse. And only Congress can essentially make new money available. What several of the executive actions do is repurpose some funding that's already been spent or is already sitting in funds for other purposes. Uh, for instance, some of the unemployment uh, options that the administration is giving to states for additional unemployment um, funding, the money is being repurposed away from a disaster-related fund. Uh, the kind of thing that goes to FEMA to prepare for hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes, et cetera. Um, so again, the, the main difference in executive actions and legislation is that um, executive actions don't have the force of law and they don't necessarily have, there's only a very limited amount that you can do without Congress when you're trying to address some of these larger issues that involve taxes and spending. Um, so it's really unclear if that's going to have impact. What we know in terms of the outlook going forward, um, I think the hopeful signs are that vulnerable members, um, those who are in tight elections on both sides of the aisle, whether that's Republicans or Democrats, are really making clear to the, their leadership um, that they do not want to go home and they do not want to face the voters without a deal in place without more, you know, investment here in fighting the pandemic in fighting the economic consequences of the pandemic. Um, I think that's a piece of hope because obviously leadership wants to be responsive to those members. Um, the House and Senate leadership remain generally in D.C. at this mo at this point. Members have started to go back to their district but they've generally been told that they're on 24 hours notice to come back and vote should a deal come through. Um, but I think what the, the real difference here and the difference maker is gonna be if when those members go home, they're really hearing from their constituents the same frustration that I think you're hearing from us today about you know, why Congress can't come together around a deal. Um, the idea that no deal itself is really unacceptable. And so I think that really leads us into our advocacy update. As Chris said, we've had a couple of uh, advocacy alerts go out, one around appropriations, one around COVID. Had great response, he'll talk about that. Um, but August really presents us with a real opportunity um, to get in front of members, whether that's virtually or otherwise, and really make our voices heard and, and send them back here with the message that we expect them to get something done. 
So with that, I'll turn it back over to Chris, uh, and he can talk a little bit about advocacy. Thanks, John. And you know, as John mentioned, I mean, the stalemate um, really provides all of us with a great opportunity to to get involved um, and and try to move things in the right direction. And with that, we'll take a look back at where we've been and. Just in the in the last month here, we've we've put out two action alerts and gotten some really great responses from people on July 21st. An action alert around FY21 appropriations um, went out uh, to 417 online advocates. Took action, sending 1,282 emails. And we know that the result uh, of that effort was that the House, the full House, did pass that funding uh, 10 days later by a vote of 217 to 197. Um, it remains to be seen, as John mentioned, as to, as to what might happen um, on the Senate side or if it, it will turn into a continuing resolution. Um, that may be an issue that we'll have to, to readdress with a future action alert. We'll, we'll stay posted on that. Um, but thank you to everyone who got involved in, in sending the word out on that issue. More recently, uh, last week, we sent out another action alert trying to urge members to, to take into account the unique priorities of people with disabilities in whatever the next COVID response package is. Now, obviously, despite 512 advocates sending 1,613 emails, uh, the results of that effort uh, remain to be seen, but it just means that there's more of an opportunity for us to keep knocking on those doors and, and reminding members that these issues do matter to real people and should not be left out to, to wait for a response. So that leads well into what we can do during the August recess. As John said, members their schedules are, are slightly tentative uh, around some of the negotiations going on, uh, but luckily for us, in some ways, we have this new normal of using video conferencing technology and Zoom meetings to, to talk with people, um, and that can certainly be an option when interfacing with members or their staff. So even during a pandemic, they need to be hearing from their constituents, including virtually, and we really want to take advantage this month um, to try to get some of our regional champions an audience with, with members of Congress. So I'm here to help on that. We know that your stories matter. We know that, that your voices and your opinions, as John said, are probably going to be the deciding factor on really moving the ball on any of these issues. So please reach out to me, C. Carson at ChristopherReeve.org. Um, we have a package of, of talking points and materials that I can send you. I can assist you in, in scheduling those meetings and you know, help you communicate with staff um, to find a way that, that works for everyone. But the thing that I'll reiterate here is that the pandemic is a serious, a serious issue, um, but it really is your elected member of Congress's job to make themselves available. And, um, you know, you get, sometimes you need to be persistent, you need to be flexible, uh, but you elected them, you have a right to, to tell them what matters to you and, and what they need to be doing at this vital time. So please reach out to me and I'll help you out with anything in regards to that. And moving on to November, we know that there's lots of conversations going on now in regards to voting and what the particular challenges might be. And while we don't have all the answers uh, in, that, in that area, we thought it was important to just highlight that it's an issue and to again, make ourselves available to you uh, for any advice or help that you might need in navigating this, this complex um, predicament. And I was actually on a coalition call last week where they were talking about this very issue and um, some of the folks on that call were, were talking specifically about the Help America Vote Act and, and some of the provisions that are in that bill. 
which which could really be useful um, in this particular moment. And I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on that legislation, uh, but it kind of got my attention that that's something that I'd like to revisit to see exactly what tools are, are in the toolbox for all of us. The important thing to note, though, is that voting infrastructure and voting capacity is really a state-by-state -state issue. So it's really important that you try to stay up to date on what's going on in your state as far as the, the COVID response and then what their board of elections or their uh, their secretary of state is doing to ensure uh, fair elections. You know, a few examples on some differences are uh, the state of Florida is now allowing if you want to register for an absentee ballot, a, a member of your family can fill that registration form out for you and deliver it, but they need to be of certain relations. Uh, in Texas, if, if you're worried about going into a polling station, Texas is allowing you to drop off your ballot curbside, but it's an absentee ballot, so you would need to have certain pieces of identification inside your ballot. And these are all very specific requirements that each state has. So take a look at that website that we list there, vote.org backslash COVID, um, where you can really check in and, and look up the specific uh, requirements of your state, and more importantly, what your state is doing to, to help ensure access to the ballot for everybody, because each state is, is doing something different. Um, and once again, Please, on this issue, any other issue that we've talked about, do not hesitate to reach out to me. As, I'm, as I said earlier, I'm really excited to be here and really looking forward to working with everyone. So um, we'll gladly take any of your questions. All right. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yep. Thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate it. And. Before, I want to make sure if there's anyone who has any questions, please feel free to um, write them right there in the chat box or the audience chat. I also want to acknowledge James Mursa. I'm sorry, James, um, that you didn't have an opportunity to actually tell us about this. And we'll be sure to share this with our advocates after the webinar uh, via email. But uh, James, is a, James is a fantastic and amazing advocate from Michigan. Many of you may know him. He's reported on his activities with the uh, Raise Family Caregiver Advisory Council, of which he's a member through the Administration for Community Living, really informing policy around caregiving, and he's serving as um, an individual living with a disability, and I believe he may be um, uh, uniquely positioned to offer his particular perspective because he is a wheelchair user. So we're really grateful for his service, and he's reminding us that there will be the, uh, the fifth meeting of the council will be open to the public on August 12th. So I'll make sure when Chris sends around the updated materials and the recording of the webinar that we include that information. Oh, that's tomorrow. So we'll be sure we get it out. I just checked the calendar. So we'll be sure to get that information out to everybody. So thank you, James. Um, I don't see any other questions. Uh, we really appreciate your time and effort and dedication to the foundation and advancing our priorities and we are really grateful to be working all together. So I hope everyone stays safe and cool, and please always feel free to reach out to us. Okay, thank you.